Welcome to the Theology Nerd Podcast with the Dr. Trip Fuller. This is a shorter Q&A episode where your friendly local internet theologian answers questions submitted by you. There are lots of ways you can submit a question for Trip to answer. You can go to homebrewchristianity.com, click the send voicemail button on the right hand side near the scroll bar. Uh, you can also leave a five star review on iTunes and just put your question as the review. You can also tweet at Trip Fuller, that's two P's and two L's. Uh, or you can send an email with your question to mediaguru at homebrewedchristianity.com. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and to our email list. That way you never miss out on new episodes or live events near you. Just go to homebrewedchristianity.com to learn more. What is up? This is Trip, and we're here answering some questions. You know, hit me back. Tell me what you're thinking. First question is from Ann Peterson. And by the way, Ann Peterson wrote a really cool book called God Creation and All That Jazz. You should check it out. Anyway, Ann asks, I believe the Christian tradition is a living tradition, and therefore the canons of the Bible are not closed. How would communities decide what new text to be considered to be part of an ongoing living Bible or canon. And the question, right, around how you decide also depends on whether or not you've even thought of the canon of Scripture being open or closed. Now, if you're totally going, why are we talking about uh, military hardware here, Trip? The thing is, the canon is not like a boom, boom cannon. It's a read, read cannon. <laughs> uh, cannon is uh, the collection of texts that the church uh, put into scripture. The You have the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, um, as Christians call it. And you have the New Testament. If you're Catholic, there's also stuff that goes in the middle. The Apocrypha. Anyway, uh, those are the texts that um, at a series of church councils, uh, the church selected as the centered uh, collection, the authoritative collection for the church, its life, its mission, its self-understanding and such. Um, so when you ask the question of whether canon, to open canon or not, um, I think there's a question at first is, do you open it or not? And the reasons you could give each way are really helpful. Uh, and Anne's not the only person asked around canon and opening it and closing it, uh, but you know, hers came in first, so I read that one. So I decided I would try to come up with three reasons to open canon and three reasons to keep it closed, and then we can see what y'all think, all right? And I'll try to make the case either way uh, because I've changed my mind. I made myself change my mind, and y'all may even have better reasons, and then it's just like, boom, close it, or boom, open it, all right? So reasons to open the canon. Number one, look, Trip. This is me talking to myself. That's weird, but we're gonna stick with it. Look, Trip. If you de- if you if you open up the canon, if you bring in other texts from the history and life of the church, other literary expositions of God's presence in history, then you will decenter the voices that have dominated and shaped the life of the church thus far. You will um, fix a number of issues, right? Okay, because we have a love-hate relationship with the Bible. It's the very place a lot of stories, narratives, uh, goodness happened in our lives, and yet it also carries around a lot of baggage and questions and doubts, and it gets used in ugly ways. We wonder if it can be used differently. But one way we could probably settle, reshape, reorganize this problem around the authority of Scripture and the canon is, what if you just added other voices? Maybe voices that were just as passionate and faithful and beautiful, but from different parts of the church's history, from different ex- cultural expressions, not just the you know, texts that come out of the life and history of Israel and the early church so steeped in uh, Hellenistic culture of thought reflection. What if, what if we added texts from uh, other continents? other periods of history? What if we saw as essential to our identity as Christians 
a greater diversity of voices and texts, if we decentered those voices, then they could sit there and speak in their voice and their history and their time and their situation and their context, but they wouldn't be heard as this final closed collection of testimonies about who God is, where God is, and what God's story is up to and sounds like. That's the first one. It decenters the voices have dominated thus far, and thus you don't dismiss them. You amplify them. Second one. If we open canon, it would force the the church to identify the presence of God or the voice of God in a history usually left to literalist readings. And here's what I mean. Like if you read something literally, either the Bible, you read it literally, and you're just like, obviously, there was a fish and Jonah was in it three days. And then a Bible scholar is like, yeah, but that story is about a whole lot more. And the fish and its literalness is kind of tertiary to the main point. That's beside the point. If you read it literally, that's how you read it. Or there are, um, and we'll talk about this in one of the other questions, there are people that read the cosmos literally, where if it's not explainable by science, then we just haven't discovered it yet because everything is explainable by science. It all gets reduced down to these basic laws, realities, and you can describe it that way, and it flattens the world. Now, what happens a lot of times when you learn church history, especially in a seminary or something, you learn the history from a historian. And what do historians do? They have readings of history. And when we tell the history of the church, we could talk about the movement and political powers with the pope at this place and this German lord here and this and that. Or is it connected to a way a new philosophy entered the church and then the people started hearing it and understanding it had fights or whatever. Like you describe the history of the church just like you describe the history of the United States or whatever. And at no point in the history – Do you go, and here's what the Holy Spirit was up to, and here's where God was in this. That's just not how a historian talks or thinks. It's not a criticism of historians. It's just that it it often sounds like when we talk about the history of the church that there is like Pentecost, and then there's this early church period where all these decisions are happening and stuff that is flying around. And then by the time Constantine's there, you're just like, he did that for imperial reasons. And after that, we don't know where God is, at least until our denomination was invented. And I'm saying that if we open the canon, then we would start to go through our history and say that in every age and every time and every place, where is it that we want to canonize voices who echoed the voice of God in that situation? And it would force us to identify the presence and voice of God throughout our throughout our church's history. And so often we hear the history um, without – as if the history went by and God wasn't present in it and at work in it and wrestling with its failures and the beauty and all that kind of stuff. And we start to go like, here's where the voice of God is. Then, you know, oh, here's an example. The last question I'm going to ask is like, what would you add to canon? Like. If you were going to add something to canon, what would it be? And the example uh, that that immediately popped in my mind is MLK's letter uh, from the Birmingham jail. I mean, it's freaking awesome. Now, if we canonize that, which I have as an American, if I'm trying to think of stuff we'd canonize that comes out of the life and history of the church, what have we learned and continually wrestled with the issue of race here in that? That'd be, that'd, that'd be awesome. No, if we were like, that's canonized then it would be real hard for us to go to those other parts of canon and other parts of scripture and manage to still preserve the power of white privilege and racism in America uh, or, or leave the text ambiguous to it, right? Because canon keeps reading canon. And if the letter from a Birmingham jail is in there, MLK is going to say, oh, you don't read Paul that way or no. You know, so anyway, so second one is you force the church to identify the presence and voice of God in the history usually left to more literalist readings. Number three reason to open the canon, saying no to certain texts can be as powerful as saying yes to others. So if you're going like, what are we going to canonize? And when you say, no, we're not canonizing this, 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 and this. And yes, we're canonizing this. The no's can be just as powerful. Like we won't canonize certain things if we're deciding. And when we say no to, I don't know, John John Piper says when he's like, all this natural disaster happened because of sin and the, the, the homosexual agenda is rampant in America. You know, that kind of stuff where 
like saying no to things that are powerful or saying no to, I don't know, the purpose driven life, the prayer of Jabez and being like, no, uh, yeah, we're not sticking that in canon. The New York Times is not the best at identifying texts that attend to the sacred with that intensity. And saying no to that like could really provide clarity because I think a lot of people don't actually read the canon we have. They read books where people footnote the Bible and then end up running around thinking they're thinking biblically or something, and they're marginally related to the conversation Scripture has. So those are at least three good reasons to open canon. Now you can think of yours, Adam. In the post, you know, and now three reasons to keep that cannon close. That's my like angry dad face. I hope, hope it didn't blow your mind. Anyway, uh, first reason our problem today is interpretation or hermeneutics, and it's not textual. So if we go to open cannon, you have all the issues that happen when you open cannon. And what it does is then you're just like fighting to get more words in and words that say what you want said or resonate with what you resonate with. And the real issue we have as a church isn't that um, we need the text to say more. It's that we haven't even learned to interpret them well. Like we have a hermeneutical problem, which is like how you interpret text. Or you have an interpretive problem, not a textual one. It's not like we need more more narratives to read or stories or whatever. The, the biggest problem we're facing as a church is that we don't even read the ones we have or learn to read it well. You know, it's kind of like you don't double the size of a playbook when you in football when the offensive line doesn't even know how to block and the running back doesn't even know how to hold the ball. The church today is sitting there running around like we're being, quote, biblical Christians or faithful or whatever, but you haven't even learned to read Scripture well. It's our readings and engagements of Scripture are so determined by things that are unrelated to the text itself that uh, if we open canon, it's just going to put more texts that we'll project our agendas on and refuse to read and engage faithfully. So don't do it. All the time you're going to spend deciding what to stick in. Take that much time and learn to read texts more deeply. That's just, that's my first option. Second one. Oh, don't, don't you open canon. Don't do it, Trip. I know you were thinking about it, but here's the thing. If we open canon, what comes in is not coming through an ecumenical council, right? Like the Bible we have was something that all the Christ, all Christians around the world kind of share the Hebrew scriptures, the New Testament. You have the Apocrypha that um, the Catholic Church has, but uh, like we all identify the same text as sacred. And if we if we open it up, everyone's not going to agree on the same thing anymore. There's two churches, too big, it's too diverse, and it would add a whole nother a whole host of trajectories of disunity, right? Like if you, if these people have canonized this and these have canonized this and these have canonized this and this has canonized this, then the new things will start shaping and sending the church into all sorts of different directions. Just like if you ask uh, Second Temple period Judaism, the period of Judaism that the early church is inheriting before the destruction of the temple in 70 CE or 80, um, there you have... Um, Christianity would have been a, an expression of Judaism before the destruction of the temple, right? Like one of the live Judaisms of the day was Christianity. And when the text of the early church are canonized and come, they come into the church and become authoritative, it sets the church on a trajectory all the way to the point we don't even recognize that as Gentiles, we're being grafted in to the history and people of Israel, and we have this legacy of anti-Semitism, as if Gentiles wrote anything in the Bible, old or new, right? Um, and so I would be worried that if we open up canon, it's going to get open, but it ain't gonna, we aren't going to get the same conclusions everywhere, and the disunity in the different parts of the church will grow because all of a sudden some groups will have something in it. That then gives them like an authoritative cleaver for their team to wage against the others. Yeah. Third reason. And this is probably my favorite. You don't want to open, you don't want to open the canon. You know what people are gonna do? They're gonna pick texts they like. They're gonna pick texts that make sense to them on the surface immediately. What's up with that? Here's the thing. 
You can't open the canon. You got to keep the Bible weird. That's right. The Bible should be weird. You should read it and go, why the hell am I reading this? What's going on here? This is a different world, a different history, different people, different customs. If I want to get something out of this, I'm going to have to stick with it. I'm going to have to dig with it. I'm going to have to enter a conversation that has been going on before I was born and it will still be going on after I die. And this conversation is about how you read this text. So it gives you life, gives the people life, calls something beautiful out of you. Keep the Bible weird. Don't make it so easy to get in because I don't, I don't want my, my sacred text coming to me like a Waffle House. Like a Waffle House omelet where you just, or no, the hash browns, where you go in and like, well, they're scattered and splattered and diced or whatever, where you start adding text that are too easy and you just go in like it's a Waffle House menu owning it. Like, I'm going to do this up. No, I want it weird. I want it like, I got to, who knows what the chef's bringing today. I'm it. I got to see how it's going to go. Or maybe uh, you keep it weird like, uh, uh, I mean, it's one of the battles that happens in a lot of cities, like to keep Austin weird, and then other cities picked it up. But the whole thing was, like, if you turn a city in that's cool into looking like the downtown of another city, then it's not even that city anymore. You keep it weird. And uh, there was a whole pushback to classical liberal theology. Um, Karl Barth makes this point and others that the Bible itself you know, comes out of these two historic traditions of the people of Israel and the early church, but it brings a world that's extremely strange. And part of the power of scripture is that to understand it, you have to enter this strange world that it's describing. And it's strangeness, yes, is in one part that the one who died accursed is also revealing the presence, uh, character, and nature of God, but also you're entering a strange world that isn't ours and that a sacred text is not just an invitation to find the conclusion of what god wants for you the world or morals or whatever it's an invitation into a narrative where the world we live in the world will go back to after wrestling with it um isn't at home and if i if we open canon there might be more and more texts that are familiar that we'll cling to and go to rather than doing the hard work of entering a really strange world with these crazy characters like Abraham and Sarah and such. So yeah, the third reason is I like to keep the Bible as strange as possible. So don't open that canon. The other part is, and why Anne's question around the canon was the one I read first, because she talks about a living Bible or a canon. And I, and I, I like the notion of, a quote living bible not like the transliteration or paraphrase version of the bible the living bible that that is growing i just wonder if part of the livingness that both answers this question agree with whether you open canon or not part of the living bible is the way in which scripture we engage it and it lives in and among us and comes out of us a second way the bible continues to live is when we pick up These conversations and arguments about texts that have gone on for 2,000 years, Christians have been wrestling with these texts, and now we get to join the argument. They will still be going on after we're dead. And so the Bible keeps living because its meanings aren't set. In the wrestling with these texts, our own meaning, our own – like we are exposed and opened up in reading these texts. And so the scripture becomes alive as we wrestle with it and – not only uh, does a quest to find the meaning of a text fail, but uh, the assurity or assumptions we bring about who we are and what the truth is uh, get opened up as well. So in that third element of a living Bible will be opening the canon. canon and I don't know if uh, um, yeah, is that necessary or not. So what do you think? What are other reasons to keep the Bible canon open? Or to keep it close, to open the canon, or keep it closed, and most importantly, what what would you add to canon? And I gave the example of a letter from the Birmingham jail just because it's so good. But if I said, you know, could you open up to the book of Birmingham, chapter two, verse three, where Brother MLK says, "Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere." We are caught 
in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now just scoot on with me to the next paragraph where he points out these two confessions. These two confessions he has to make towards his Christian and Jewish brothers where he said, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice prefers a negative peace, which is absence of which is the absence of tension to a positive peach, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with the methods of your direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season, shallow understanding from uh, from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Church, I'm going to say that again. See, this is what I'm saying. You open the cannon up, I want burning him. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute understanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.